Hello and welcome everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to be with all of you here today on Friday with my wonderful new friend and CODA enthusiast, AJ. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Maria Marquis. I am dialing in today from our glorious Mountain View location, uh, high up in the sky. And here at CODA, I consider myself the chief cheerleading officer. I love just celebrating our makers, nerding out on CODA, learning together, and just creating some space for creativity and intellect to come together in this magical moment moment. Now, lucky for all of you, I'm joined by the fabulous AJ. AJ, do you want to introduce yourself to everyone so they know a little bit about who you are? Hey, everyone. I'm AJ. I'm a director of product at Brex. Uh, we're a company on a mission to provide an all-in-one all -in financial uh, product for um, small businesses and startups and uh, companies of various different sizes to really help them reach their full potential. And we kind of started out with a corporate card a couple of years ago, but now mm -hmm. we have um, a cash management product and also spend product. Um, I've been in fintech for about four years now. Previously, it was at Coinbase, but also was a product manager at Google for a while. Founded a few of my own startups, and I'm a massive Coda fan. I would probably say I'm like number one Coda fan at Brex, maybe <laughs> with the exception of Zach, who's the chief product officer. He kind of brought Coda to Brex um, after him and Shashir talked about it. Um, but I've been a fan ever since. Um, and I also run a Coda 101, Coda for Dummies class at Brex as well that I started doing um, just last month to, to help new people on board Coda because we actually use a lot of Brex um, for many of the different processes we have, which I'm happy to talk about. Mm -hmm. I love it. And AJ, while we were waiting to get started, was actually telling me about uh, how he teaches his Coda for Dummies class. And it's super cool and really exciting. And I, I think we'll talk a little bit more about kind of how you got your team on board today, because I know a lot of folks are interested in like, hey, if I'm the, the number one Coda fan at my office, mm -hmm. how do I get everybody on board? I love for sure. it. So we're going to be talking a lot today about the quarterly planning doc that you will actually publish and, and still use. Um, but mm -hmm. before we jump into the doc itself, I just want to make sure that everybody knows how to get in touch with us as we move through today, because ultimately it's about a conversation we're all going to have. Hey, Mel, so good to see you. So um, how it's going to work over there on the right side of your screen. Mel's already found it. Scott gave us a wave. That's a chat field that's public. You can use that at any point in time to just share what's on your mind. We love to hear from you. So know that that's there. But if you have a question today, I will ask that everybody please use the ask a question button along the bottom of the screen. That way it doesn't get lost in the chat and AJ and I can make sure that we answer those most pressing questions as early as possible. Now, the other nice thing about ask a question is you can actually upvote and downvote questions. That helps AJ and I prioritize. And there's no such thing as an interruption in our virtual session here today. Ask a question, comment at any time. We are here for you. I love it. We've got Chicago in the house today. Aviva, Laura, Mel, everybody dialing in. <laughs> I'm from a little bit north of there. So, you know, there we go. <laughs> Excellent. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Remember everybody, questions, comments, always welcome. We wanna hear from you. No need to wait for us to stop talking because I'm sure AJ and I could talk about Coda nonstop for probably about a week, I'm thinking. No breaks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> right. at least, right. Let's, uh, let's uh, get a little bit of a dare going. So since we're talking about quarterly planning, that doesn't suck. I love that that's how you all have named it. I'd love to just travel back in time. Let's get into our time machine. How were you all doing quarterly planning at Brex before Coda came on the scene? What did that look like, the tools you were using? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I joined Brex in January of last year. And at the time, I don't think we actually had a quarterly planning process. We started <laughs> doing it in around Q2 of last year. And at the time, uh, I was leading the platform team, um, which I still am today. Um, the team wasn't that big at the time. It was just a couple of um, sub teams within it. Mm -hmm. And um, quarterly planning was a pretty haphazard process. It mostly focused around coming up with our OKRs um, mm -hmm. and working out the projects we'd be working on. But most teams kind of did it in their own way. So mm -hmm. a lot of it happened inside docs. Each team would then use spreadsheets to plan between them. But there wasn't really a way we centralized that process or a way we coordinated it between teams. And sure. some of the um, pain points with that was, for example, we have a pretty large customer support and ops team. They have a lot of different requests they need support from, from our engineering product and design teams um, every quarter. And so they would create a spreadsheet uh, for their support and what they need. Then each team would have their own spreadsheet and each of those spreadsheets would have dependencies on other engineering teams. So like the cash team might have a dependency on the platform team around onboarding. Um, and so there was a lot of 
um, basically decentralized conversations happening between different teams. And the biggest challenge was knowing what was going on and how progress was being made in, in planning. I think the other thing that was a challenge at the time is that um, we hadn't really worked out how to find the right get, uh, mix between planning that happens at the leadership level and what's bubbled down to the teams versus sure. planning that happens from the bottom up. Um, and so those are things we all wanted to, we wanted to solve with um, the new quarterly planning process when we adopted Coda. Yeah, and I, I think that this is something that really resonates with me because I feel like this cobbling together of spreadsheets and different people's styles is something that's pretty common, right? That we, we talk about the importance mm -hmm of OKR, objective key result, goal setting all the time, but the process usually ends up being like a Frankenstein's monster of like, well, here's my spreadsheet and here's yeah. my pieces of paper on the wall. <laughs> Got it. So then um, when you were setting out to do Coda, it sounds like the biggest things we wanted to solve was how do we translate top down and also kind of reduce that siloing. Any other problems that you were looking to solve as you were sitting down getting ready to build? Yeah, so there were a few things. I would say um, just to kind of give you an idea of the structure of our mm -hmm. quarterly planning. So the quarterly planning uh, process of Brex works in a few different ways. So first, the leadership team will get together along with our finance team mm -hmm. and think about what are the main things we want to achieve in the next quarter and how does that translate into OKRs? And we'll Go come ahead. up with essentially a financial forecast as we are a fintech company, along with a set of OKRs that might be related to that forecast, but some of them may not be. Some of them may be related to reliability. Some of them may be related, related to reducing the amount of uh, manual interventions, um, but some of them may be related to our GMV, which is um, how much transactions we, we process on our card or mm -hmm. how many um, customers are active on the product. And so that happens before the planning uh, process starts for the rest of the teams. And it usually happens around the sixth or seventh week of the quarter. Okay. So once we do that, um, the leadership team then provide um, the, those OKRs at the company level to all of the teams and walk them walk through the managers, uh, the whole management team of Brex, so anyone that's a manager, um, along with all the product managers, uh, get a preview of that. And so um, that's kind of where the planning process starts. And then we kind of think about it as like a W. And so what I mean by that is uh, the leadership team start and they push down the plan at a very high level. And then the teams take that plan and create their plans. Um, each team uh, looks at those quarterly um, uh, objectives and key results and thinks about what the OKRs are for each of their teams. And mm -hmm. then we bubble that back up to the leadership team in the form of a QBR, which is quarterly business review that each large mm -hmm. team does. So the platform team does one, and the cash team does one, where we write up what we learned from the quarter, what went well, what went didn't, and what our plans are for the next quarter. Then the leadership team will go through those quarterly business reviews along with the leads of each of those teams. We usually do that in a review meeting that mm -hmm. happens around the second or third usually the third week of planning, and then they'll provide feedback and then we might adjust some of the plans. So it kind of goes like that. I love it. Um, yeah, and so the the question was like, how do we put that into a process that feels consistent that everyone can follow? Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, it had been pretty haphazard and pretty decentralized, and there were a few important things we need to solve for. So the first one is making sure everyone understood the company level objectives, the company level strategy, and so they had all the context they needed to make the right decisions on their team. Because it's really hard to make the right decisions on your team if you don't know where you fit into the broader company uh, strategy and the goals of the company. So we had to be able to communicate that. Uh, the second thing is we wanted to be able to create a space where everyone could put in their OKRs and everyone else could see them. Because we wanted to make sure that all the OKRs at the bottom of the W lined up with all the OKRs at the company level. Because if the right. teams are coming up with OKRs that don't necessarily uh, line up with a company level OKRs, it means that we're not going to hit our goals. Mm -hmm. And so that was really important. So we want to create visibility around that. Okay. And whereas before we had it happening in a lot of different places, we needed to happen in one place. So each team could provide their OKRs in one place. The second thing is we wanted to make sure those OKRs aligned with our objectives. So instead of each team having their own objectives, we let each team pick their own key results, but the objectives have to be the same as the company objectives. And what Ooh, that means is that, that we knew that everyone is working on the same important themes. And then this, uh, the second thing is, um, all the teams would pick their projects and teams are responsible for deciding what projects they want to work on and their own roadmaps. That isn't really uh, decided at the leadership level unless there's mm -hmm. something strategically important we need to do in a quarter. But then one of the challenges is the teams have dependencies with each other. And so we needed a place where those dependencies could be um, escalated and they could be visible to other teams so that each team could see what dependencies they have for other teams and what dependencies other teams have on them. So that was really important because in the second week of planning, once we've come up with all the projects, we need to resolve those dependencies. There's a limited number of resources across the whole company. At the time when we created this, I think there was about 
100 to 150 people in the whole of engineering product and design wow. in a 300 or uh, 50 person org, I think. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of different asks and how do we resolve those dependencies? Um, and then the last thing is uh, knowing when those dependencies are resolved and being able to escalate anything that wasn't resolved yet. And so mm -hmm. that's really what we need to solve for in that planning process. Um, yeah. And that's what we try to do with the uh, quarterly planning that doesn't suck. But, <laughs> I love it. And one thing that you said for me that really resonates is this idea of if an organization is really good at their goal setting, right? Like, okay, great. We know what we're going to do. But mm -hmm. I feel like we often forget about the dependency piece, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, oh, my objective completely relies on you all doing things, but you're oversubscribed. And so I love that that yep. was part of the intentionality here. Amazing. All right. I'm going to go ahead. Let's go ahead and take a look at the template. Um, I'm actually, That's first good. of all, going to copy a link. So if folks want to go ahead and grab a copy themselves, this is uh, the doc that we're gonna be working on. I'm gonna share my screen here. And folks, if you just give me a yes, uh, I can see it, some kind of signal, looks great, best doc I've ever seen over there in chat. When you can see my screen, that'd be great. And also let me know if you'd like me to zoom in at all, happy to do so. So if you can see my screen, give me a yes, looks great, I can see it, some kind of signal there in chat. So I know we're all set, feeling good. Mm-hmm. Perfect. AJ can see it. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. So um, also, just a reminder, everybody, if at any point in time you have a question for me or AJ, you can always just post it to the ask a question area at the bottom of the screen. That is always available for you. You don't need to wait until the end. We're happy to answer anything that's on your mind even before we begin. Right on. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so here we are in quarterly planning that doesn't suck, a very official term. Um, and I love we've just got like a bit of a write up here, which is kind of what you were talking about, AJ, sort of the, the, the origin story behind this little hero doc. But let's kind of walk through. So uh, this getting started element, do you want to talk a little bit about how uh, these different ingredients, you know, the milestones, the schedule and the OKRs fit together? Anything that would be helpful for folks to know about kind of this, this aspect? Yeah, so um, one of the really important things that we were, that happened when we started this process, we just transitioned to being remote first. Mm. <clears throat> and so as a result, it was really important that we could convey this information in an asynchronous way. And so we created this getting started guide so everybody could read through it and understand exactly how planning worked. And we also created the schedule as part of this process, which I didn't talk about earlier, which is actually really important so that everybody understands when each step of planning will happen. Um, this was really important because it helped everyone understand what the expectations are for each step of planning, what they need to get done, and also the context I mentioned earlier of why we are doing the th things we're doing. <coughs> I love it. I like it. Even put the little check boxes in here so that everybody can see exactly kind of where we're at. Amazing, excellent. So then, uh, let's talk about the long-term milestones. I'm assuming that this is really uh, where, if we think about the W, this is kind of the first peak of the W. Is that correct? Um, yes, that's correct. So um, this is usually where you talk about the long-term milestones and the strategy of the company. So mm -hmm. the idea here is really to set the set the story of what we want to do for the next like two to three years. And so yeah. we had just gone through building the strategy before quarterly planning started. And Zach kind of laid out the strategy. And he also said what, in our version of the stock, we talk about what success looks like at the end of 2020, at the end of mm -hmm. 2021, at the end of 2022, at the end of 2023. And we built it around the key themes um, yeah. of the strategy. And so having that and having it in a place where anyone can look at it as they're thinking about planning is really helpful because it creates the right context for people to plan well. Um, totally. The way I talk about it to product managers I always work with is like you want when you do it to do planning well, you want to create a really good box, but then let people play in the box as much as possible. But the box has to have like very clear boundaries. Yes, yes. Constraints breed creativity, I often say. And what I like about this is that even though it's, you know, a very simple text page, it allows anybody who starts to get the full context, right? I don't have to worry about, oh, I wasn't here when that three to five year strategy was set, so I got no idea. It allows you to really capture it. And then that kind of longer term vision is, is directly connected with the more tactical quarterly process. I, I love that. Uh, excellent, so let's take a look at company OKRs. So here, this is again, is that kind of uh, still in that top part of the W, but like a little bit more uh, shorter term, correct? Yeah, so this is really looking at the OKRs for the next quarter. So this mm -hmm. is giving everyone kind of the com compass of what we want to achieve for the quarter. And yeah. so as people look at this, everything they want to do um, in their team should bubble up to these goals at the mm -hmm. company level. 
Got it. So in this case, executives set, this is exactly what we're going to do. And then the teams get to add the, to your point, the, the key results that they want to do to contribute to that. So it sounds like this part is set, right? That the company OKR, but then the creativity can come from, all right, well, for us on sales, we really want to focus on getting 500,000 customers mm -hmm. closed. And I love yeah. what you've done here with the, the lookup columns, right? You've got this lookup column that's going to uh, that, that team table. So I can mm -hmm. see exactly like what's going on with sales, the description and who leads it. I love that. Yep. And then um, folks, uh, we've got another lookup column coming up here, looking back here to that key results so we can populate it. And I love that we can just hover over it and see everything else about that there. Anything yep. else about this kind of uh, company OKR page that you think is relevant for folks to know? Um, yeah, so I think um, when you're building out this page, it's important to kind of think about what you want to get to at the end and then sure. work backwards from there. Um, so if you think about it from this perspective, like we built it out so that you could come in and look at the objectives and see all the relevant key results across the mm -hmm. whole company. Um, and to do that well, you have to start thinking from the point of view of like, okay, what do I need to have in place in order to make that happen? Well, now I need a team OKR table. Team OKR table needs to have the key results for each of the teams. And so that's why we built it this way, so it could then bubble back up to that company level of OKRs. I love it. We've got a question here from Aviva, which is, do you do your OKR tracking in Coda as well? So I'm assuming that we kind of bubble all the way down to the team level. Is that correct? Yes, that's a good question. So um, we don't do our OKR tracking in Coda right now. The main reason is because most of our OKR um, results are generated via um, our data um, mm. store. And so we have Snowflake as our data store, we use Looker in order to do all our analytics. And then we output those analytics into um, a spreadsheet, which then connects to a presentation called a weekly business review that we review every single week. Um, there isn't a great way of doing that in Coda right now, but I'm sure as soon as we have one, we would love to move it to Coda. <laughs> Um, I don't think there's a Looker integration coder at the moment, but I'd be so happy if there was one. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really good call out for us. I know we have some codins here on the call, so let's take note of that. I mean, my guess is you could do something with, uh, a lot of folks will just embed, right? Like um, yeah. I know that um, one of our customers, Mode, they embe embed Mode dashboards of their different um, their mm -hmm. different stats metrics. That's the word I'm looking for inside of Coda. But I love that idea of kind of deepening it. And I think we might have some things in the hopper that might be able to address that in the future. So <gasps> teaser trailer. Thanks, Aviva. Great question. Keep those questions coming, everybody. Um, one thing I will add is that we, while we don't um, uh, look at the company level KRs um, within uh, Coda, I run my own team's KR updates within Coda, and I can talk about that later as well. Ooh, very cool. Yeah. Let's see. I'm going to make a note. We need the KR team in a moment. Excellent. Uh, one thing I really like about this page, honestly, is it's very simple, right? It's very effective because we have everything here. But notice, this is just two tables with everything captured so that you don't need to get super fancy or involved because it's really, to your point, you figured out what did you need, and then I'm mm -hmm. going to solve that problem with exactly what I need. But I love the clarity of this page. Amazing. All right, let's take a look um, then. Um, uh, we've got these elements here. So this is what you were talking about, about then having every team kind of have their own area to be able to view it. Can you walk us through what we're seeing here? Yeah, so um, the great thing about Coda, which I really love, is that it's really kind of like a database with a doc front end that I try to explain to people. And what that means is you can take that team OKR table and you can filter it by every single team and have a sub page for every team. What that means is every team has a home in this document where they build their own KRs. And so they can add their KRs here in the first table. <coughs> and then those KRs actually connect to dependencies for projects that they can add here too. Nice. So the dependencies here, if I'm reading this right, this is a lookup column to that KR table. So they can say, mm -hmm. hey, this one that, you're wor that we're working on, we want to be able to actually then log. And this is, I'm assuming, coming from that same Teams table. Um, mm -hmm. We know that we need platform experience here. So um, when you were thinking through how you wanted to have dependencies reflected, because I know a lot of Coda customers are always thinking about how can we capture dependencies in an accurate way? So how did you think about kind of what you needed to solve the dependency problem? Can you walk us through the thought process there? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the way we did it is um, we try to focus first on what the key result you want to achieve. And mm -hmm. then we let you put in projects related to that key result. So in this case, it's lower AWS fees. Mm -hmm. And then tag in the blocking team because we have that team table. And then you tag in the blocking need, which is I need X, Y, and Z from this team. Got it. 
Um, and then the dependents, dependent, the dependent teams can respond. And the reason they know how to respond is if you look underneath, it says finance, things others need from you. Because we know who the finance team are and what things are blocked on the finance team, they get all of their dependencies appearing here too. So this becomes nice. a one place where they can put all of their dependencies in and see all the dependencies they get as well. Mm -hmm. I love that because I, I like that you've put those both on the same page for, for a couple reasons. Number one, that if I'm in finance, I just know I need to go here. But number two, it lets me see kind of the balance of requests that I have versus the requests mm -hmm. that I'm giving. And it lets me see that um, sort of the volume of, of our interconnectedness, which I think is really interesting. And then this finance dependencies, this is just, uh, let's actually open up the data map because I want to just see what do we have here. Oh, where did we put that? I think it's in here now. Yeah, the doc map. Um, all right, so the dependency, this is like one overarching table then. Or are we just seeing mm -hmm. it as a view? Yeah, if you go to all projects, mm -hmm. um, you can see basically all the projects. Cool. Yeah, I love it. So then the projects in this case, we're just kind of hiding those dependency columns in other locations. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Awesome. And then, oh, yeah, great. We have this overarching uh, dependencies table. And I love we've got a select list here that's mm -hmm. being populated by a table as well. Very cool. Um, anything else for um, how you and your team, let's go to EPD because I know this is kind of your area uh, and let's kind of walk through uh, what we see here. Yeah, so um, we have a lot of teams within Brex, both engineering product mm -hmm. and design teams, finance teams, and each of those teams have teams within those teams and teams within those teams too. <laughs> and so we basically try and map the whole org hierarchy in this uh, in uh, the navigation. Mm -hmm. And so the great thing I love about Coder is you can have any number of sub pages and sub pages and sub pages. Yeah. And so basically what it comes down to is every single uh, kind of, I guess, atomic team should have a page in here and it should ladder up to every sub team, every org. So EPD is an org of engineering product and design. And yeah. so then you can go to the engineering product and design org and see all the KRs for that org. You can go to the platform team, which mm -hmm. um, I lead and you can see all the KRs for that team, which includes all of the sub teams within platform. Yeah. Very cool. And I love that you just, again, you're just laddering it up just like you would in an org chart mm -hmm. and having it all just in that one spot. So if I am, it's kind of lets me zoom in and out, right? So if I'm yeah. on the experiences team, I can get really laser focused, but I can also go, but wait, what are we doing as a whole org? Particularly because you said you had what, 150 folks in that um, when this was- Just with an engineering product and yeah. design, I think at the time it was about 300 to 400 people across yeah. the whole organization. And now we're closer to, I think six, six, six or seven hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, excellent. Any other sort of things that you should that that we should kind of raise awareness to for the team around kind of how you think about this laddering or anything that we're missing around what you've put together here? Yeah. So one of the, so there were a few things that um, I would say uh, was were issues with this process that mm -hmm. we kind of iterated on, and I'm happy yeah. to share that in a second. Mm -hmm. so the first one was um, because there was one project um, table. And the project table also had blocking teams. You could end up with a project with a number of different teams that are blocking it. Mm. And as a result, it wasn't very clear when a dependency was no longer blocking because sure. each team had to respond, but there was only one cell for everyone to respond in. So mm. a good example is if you go to the dependency uh, yep. page there, you can see that now um, there might be, um, you know, three or four blocking teams blocking one project, and then each of them has to respond with a dependency response, but they're all editing one cell at the same time. Got it. And so it's not super clear like who's responding to what. Mm -hmm. And the other challenge was it wasn't clear who to contact on that team necessarily to like talk about the dependency. Oh, sure. That was one thing. Um, another thing was there wasn't really a good process for escalating dependencies, mm -hmm. because if there is a dependency on a really important project um, and we can't escalate it, there's no way to really solve it. So we try to solve that a little bit better in the next version that we built for. Yeah. Um, H2 planning this this quarter. Amazing. And you said that we could you we could take a look at that, right? To see some of the yeah. changes. All right, I'll stop sharing. I'll tag in, boop, pop it on over to you. We can see how this is developed. And one thing I love about that is, you know, I always talk about how Coda docs are alive. They're meant to change, they're meant to grow, and they're meant for us to keep experimenting with while we get co closer and closer to understanding the problems we want to solve. So I love that you and the team really kind of took it. And again, all right, these are the things that aren't working for us. Let's figure out how to reimagine it for our mm -hmm. next quarterly planning process. And look at that code of dark mode. Beautiful. <laughs> yes, I love code of dark mode. Um, so a few things that are different in this one, I would mm -hmm. say. So the instructions and everything are the same, but we also created a resolving dependency um, matrix cool. um, that quickly like talks about all of the things that are dependencies that need to be resolved and are escalated with decision makers. We added questions people had for planning. 
oh, this is a question that we need to resolve. And then we also, some teams added specific dependencies that they want to call out or ask as well. And so that made it a little bit better, I would say. Um, so that was kind of one of the improvements um, yeah. that helped escalate those dependencies. And as you can also see here, our org is a lot bigger now. There are like <laughs> many different say. teams, <laughs> um, teams within teams, teams within teams within teams. Um, probably a good example is here of the card team uh, that has all these teams within it, the core team that has these teams and teams within teams. And so <laughs> it still it was able to scale to that. Yeah. Uh, one thing I do think that was uh, a struggle towards the end of quarterly planning is that the dependency table just became huge. There was, I think, mm. 700 depend different dependencies. Yeah. And so I think we need to find out a way to better prioritize dependencies next time around. Yeah. And um, one thing we also noticed is just the way the CODA, CODA loads tables um it kind of loads it as you scroll but when you mm -hmm. have a dependency table you kind of want the whole thing loaded so you can sure. look through it really quickly and so that's uh, just a piece of feedback of um, tables loaded faster that would be awesome done yes i mean the great news is you know what we've been doing a lot of um in the in the last quarter here at coda when we were doing our planning process is really focusing on performance and re-examining our code base so we're actually doing a lot of rebuilding from the ground up taking a look at that older code finding where we might have technical debt and really addressing performance as a feature right we don't just want it to be like something we think about as a later date but like you said having all of that snappy loading as quickly as possible is the thing that really makes makes it happen so we are constantly working on that um, as well. And I think that the table load, Coden's on the call. Let's definitely make note of that as something we want to share. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, and one thing I also wanted to show was kind of how, uh, I guess, like the sausage is made behind the scenes yeah. for the team to get to those OKRs. So um, on most of the teams I run, they also have their own coda that actually runs through the process of uh, outputting those OKRs. Because for a team to get mm -hmm. to that level of uh, clarity, it needs to do its own planning process with it. Sure. And so for the platform team, we had our own um, Carol list here. We had a whole planning process. So we do an, an overview. This is something I created that yeah. was basically the same as what you saw at the company level, but for the platform level. Mm -hmm. And so what it was is like, what is the strategy for the platform team? What is our timelines? What are our plans? What are um, tracking all the different teams? What are our OKRs? And yeah. the output of this ended up being what we would enter into the big company level code of doc. There's an argument to be made about whether all of this should be one giant coda doc, mm -hmm. but I think like having the focus of each team having their own coda doc just make it a bit easier for them to focus on their own area. And so yeah. there's a bit of inefficiency in that we need to kind of export the OKRs back out, but generally most teams are okay with that. And yeah. then zooming in one level further, we have the card team here that have this amazing coda with their whole <gasps> planning process. So, so this is their cool. whole planning schedule. It has what they're going to do on every single day. Each team has their own roadmaps in here. And this is basically planning central for the whole card team. This is where all of the planning happens. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about creating uh, sort of the overarching page structure around day of the week, but that's amazing. I love that as a concept. I'm thinking mostly around like you could use that same pattern for you know the different meetings we have on every day mm -hmm. of the week. You could use that for onboarding for a new hire. You could use that yeah. for the planning process. Um, I love that. And it's interesting that you talk about how you kind of have every team has their own Coda doc that's like their hub mm -hmm. and then they push back up when they're ready. We actually do something yeah. very similar here at Coda too, because we found that we wanted to have each team kind of have their own hub that could be for planning, reflection, mm -hmm. as well as that more tactical, you know, week by week content. And then great, you've, you've gone into your little laboratory, you've done your things. Now that you're ready, you can pop it back into the larger, we call it our cadence stock, which has everything for the entire company. So we actually do something very similar. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I think one thing uh, that was also asked earlier is how do we track OKRs? So yeah. while we don't track the company level OKRs, um, I do track the, my team's OKRs mm -hmm. in a coded doc. And so we have a platform team coded doc here and in it, there'll be OKRs and people can put in are the OKRs off track, are they on track, mm. last week's progress, this week's update. And the way this is uh, this works, I'll just give you all a quick look, um, yeah. is um, it actually has these two uh, columns. So we have this week and last week, which people don't edit, and this archive button. And what the archive button does is it copies everything from this week into last week. Nice. And then it replaces this week with the template. And so what that means is you can always see last week's and this week's. and this archive button is run using automation. Every week I was gonna say, uh, on yeah. Monday or I think Sunday night, these buttons get pressed for all the rows and it gets refreshed. So everyone can add their updates. 
That's such a great pattern for us all to remember too, because again, and I always think about Coded Docs in patterns, like what are the different modules that I can repurpose mm -hmm. over and over again? And I love this idea of kind of uh, cycling them out, right? Like, okay, I'm just gonna deal the cards and like this now goes into this pile, this goes over here. But um, having that all be something that doesn't have to happen with human intervention, because of course we're gonna forget or someone's gonna go on vacation and, and not have that there. And I love that you have yeah. this template there, amazing. Yeah, it just makes it a lot easier having the template. For a while, I was trying to code the text into the automation, but that kind of ended up being pretty unreliable. But the template allows you to just copy it over. It's yeah. like very easy to do it then pretty straightforward, like coder coding. Yeah, I love it. We actually have another question here from Julie, which is, how has the process gone with objectives being owned at the company level versus the team level? Does that lead to a lot of objectives for leadership to manage or teams feeling like they can't innovate outside the company objectives? Any reflections on that? Love that question. Um, that's a really good question. Um, we found that having objectives mm -hmm. at the company level is generally really good. Um, I'll just stop sharing my screen while I ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because um, it just means that everybody's kind of rowing in the same direction. Um, you know, we're a fast growing startup. We have limited resources. And so um, we want everyone to be able to have a space to create, but we also want to make sure that we're generally focusing on the right things. And so yeah. forcing everyone to think within the objectives of the whole company is really important. Um, I know other companies have team level objectives as well. Um, it's something we've explored as well. I think one of the challenges is that while it's super useful for the team, you end up then with like hundreds of objectives across the whole organization. Sure. And it's really hard to connect them all back to the company level objectives. So we've tried to like really stick to this like company level objectives and then team level KRs. Got it, excellent. And I'm just curious, uh, thank you for that question, by the way, Julia, that was fantastic. Um, I'm just curious, how long does your planning process take? on this quarterly that's a, level? That's a good question. So we used to do it on a quarterly level, now we do it on a halves. The mm -hmm. reason we switched to halves is because we found that if we did it every quarter, we were basically spending one third of our time in the year planning. Because sure. you spend a month planning for eight weeks of work essentially. And it, mm -hmm. planning takes up a lot of time, right? So that didn't feel super efficient. The other thing we noticed is that when we planned on a quarterly um, cadence, we didn't really give teams enough time to make big bets on larger innovations that might yeah. take a whole half. And so what we did was instead we started doing uh, half planning and we tried to condense it. And um, actually rather than um, having people do planning as part of their quarterly process, we kind of paused the whole company for the last three or four weeks of every half and everyone does planning and we do this big sprint. So the first two weeks is the, all the teams get together and they do like a, essentially something like an offsite or a hackathon where mm -hmm. they come up with all of their plans and they create this vision deck. And the cool thing about the vision deck is it gets everyone really excited about everything yeah. we're building. And we put it into a deck and it kind of lets you see across the whole company, everything we're doing for the whole of H2. And by giving everyone the space to plan across the whole of H2, we, we realized that it created a lot more innovation and people will take bigger bets. And that's what we really want to encourage is bigger bets, more um, risk taking, more innovation. Um, the second thing is it also meant that we could wrap up planning in about three or four weeks and then just be done with planning for yeah. the next six months. And so yeah. then when it came to quarterly planning, all we would do is really do updates where it was mostly just the leaders of each team providing a quarterly business review on mm -hmm. how the quarter did and making some adjustments based on what we've learned so far, but not doing a whole new planning cycle. Yeah, yeah. Well, people are really digging this vision deck idea. And I was like, oh yeah, like, because I think one of the biggest things that we need to remind ourselves of when we're doing objective and key result planning or goal setting in any way is like, if we can't get inspired by it, if it doesn't rally us, then mm -hmm. it's just going to feel like a slog. But if we have that rallying vision, it's so much easier for us to kind of have that fuel we're going to need to do the tactical work or to deal yeah. with the challenges that come our way. Amazing. Um, any, um, and yeah, just on ahead. the vision deck quickly, mm -hmm. we also did that in a W format as well. So the leadership team created a vision deck for the whole company for H2, which really talked about kind of called out some of the key investments we wanted to make and really painted the picture of what a good H2 might look like mm -hmm. without maybe dictating the exact things you want to build. So it's more like talking about what a customer's experience might like be at the end of H2. Mm -hmm. Then each team created their own vision deck as well. And it all started with the same customer story. So we'd start with a customer every H2 that we care about. And we talk about that customer and that would start the whole vision deck and every team's vision deck would start with the same customer too. And then what the team started realizing is there's other customers involved as well. So on the platform team, we've served a lot of internal customers. So they added customers, internal customers too, like actual people yeah. at uh, Brex and um, talked about how we were serving them as well. So we try to make it very customer centric and very much based around user stories. Yeah, and, and what a great box to build for people to play in, 
like that's yep. built around like that customer experience. I love that. Amazing. Um, what is your favorite part of the docs that you and the team have built for your planning process? Um, I would say my favorite part for me personally is that as someone that um, leads a pretty large org through planning right now, it's um, you know about 130 different engineering, product, and design folks. Um, they don't all report to me, but product managers generally the ones responsible for running planning. So we definitely mm -hmm. feel like we're the stewards of the process. Yeah. Um, it's just being able to scale ourselves. It's just so hard to scale a product management well, and Coder, I feel yeah. like, is a great way to scale um, product management. Um, one of the things I've kind of learned as a product leader is like so much of what I do now is being able to know which tool to use to solve what problem. Mm -hmm. And the more I can build those tools in Coda, the more easy it is for me to solve problems. Because now instead of being like, what tool do I use in my head and try to create a process for it? I can be like, mm -hmm. hey, I have a template for that. How do I solve cross-functional meetings? I have a template for that. How do I solve one-on-one? -on -one? How do I create a great one-on-one -on -one experience? I have a template mm -hmm. for that. How do I create a great quarterly planning experience? Now I have a template for that too. And so I feel like with Coda, I'm kind of building all of these tools and the great thing is every time we build those tools, we're also teaching every product manager to do to use them so that when they become a leader, they can use the same tools as well. But it's not just an abstract concept, it's an actual template that they can then take. Yeah. Let's say one day they go to another company and become um, a product lead where they're trying to lead an organization of 100 people to through planning. Well, now they have this great tool that they learn at uh, using Coda and they can just take that and recreate it again. Mm -hmm. and so that's one thing I, I like about Coda. The other thing I do like as well is, um, how we try to use Coda to be creative and create a sense of belonging. So I can quickly show you um, a very yeah. different use of Coda. Um, Love and it. so on my team, um, I have a staff meeting with all the product managers in my mm -hmm. org. And I always want to try and create a sense of belonging in that meeting. And really the goal of that meeting is to help everyone kind of feel like they're on the same team. We bubble up information, we bubble it down, but we also want to make it a place where people can get to know each other better. And so one of the cool things we do is we do the weekend update. And so um, one of the things I decided to do um, towards the, the middle of last uh, last year in the midst of the pandemic was in, uninstall Instagram. Um, I have I have twins and me and my wife definitely found the pandemic to be pretty challenging. And we had a bunch of friends that were, you know, jet setting around the world during the pandemic. And I was just like, I can't deal with my Instagram anymore. It's like too much. And so there was a part of me that just missed having that amazing photo feed. And so I was like, what if we create an Instagram for the team? And so we created this really cool um, Instagram and you can see it going back every week. And every week the team just adds a photo and a hashtag and then we just talk about it. And it's oh, a great man. way to get to know everyone on the team. And you'll see a lot of food photos, I was gonna say, a lot of I'm family hungry. photos, a lot of adventures. <laughs> these are my kids. They kind of uh, <laughs> definitely appear in a lot of, the, lot of these posts. <laughs> I love it. Um, you so can kind cute. of see them here and there. And here they are when we went on vacation last week. Um, and so this has just been a really great way to create a sense of belonging on the team that yeah. I found to be like um, really, really fun. That's so amazing. that's one example. And it's really easy to do. This is basically just a card view and you just create this form. People add their own photos into the form. They add a hashtag and then the card view is sorted by, um, by week. And it's just such a great way to connect people. Um, another fun thing we've done just to go through a few different examples. Um, so this is my, this is kind of my, uh, Org's um, kind of home base. This mm -hmm. is uh, where we do our weekly uh, meeting. This is also where we um, talk about topics that we bubble up and down. Uh, we do brainstorms here. So this mm -hmm. is a fun thing I've been doing at the end of every week because we like do a brainstorm where people can add ideas for like s big problems we want to solve. Yeah. And so we do the brainstorm as what if we, what if we do this? And so a recent one I've been doing is my org has been growing so big. I, uh, I've been asking the question and people have been trying to, uh, I've been encouraging people to fill that out asynchronously. How can I make this meeting more useful for you all? Um, and then people can upvote it. Um, but another cool uh, example is um, when we had people join early in the quarter, we wanted to create a fun way for everyone to get to know each other. So we did a year in review. And so a year in review uh, was inspired by a Coda template that I found. <laughs> um, and we got everybody to um, fill out their year in review for 2020. And we talked about it together. And so I'll just show you my example. Cool. It's really easy for everyone to fill out. They fill out the top three moments, how I spent my time, top three movies to watch, my accomplishments, what I read. And there was actually a form to fill this all out, which then yeah. generated this output. And it was just a really fun way of getting to know people on the team. And this is something I definitely want to do again at the end of this year. Yeah. I remember, I think Helena uh, made that template. Yeah. Uh, um, nice. It was a really cool template. So um, I, I'm always looking for fun templates in Coda that I can then use and bring to my team as well. 
Um, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of a different way of using Coda than um, just quarterly planning. Yeah, and what a nice way too of um, kind of creating those moments of human connection at work, right? That that this idea of we're not just you know machines, but we actually are part of a team. And how does that play out when, like you said, you're remote first and having that mm -hmm. kind of connection? And speaking yeah. of teams, I'd love to know um, kind of you know these Coda docs are incredible. They're I mean, really really detailed. There's a lot going on. They they're really profound. Um, and I just love to know, kind of, how did you get your teams on board? Right, you've got an entire organization that's using this doc. Um, well, not not this doc, but like your, you know what I mean, the big one that you made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's Friday. Yeah, I lost so, all of my words. So I'd love to know, um, kind of, how to approach that. So we started small, and the way it started out was Zach, who's the chief product officer, ran his version of this meeting uh, before our org was large enough that we had multiple different product teams where the org was pretty flat, everyone reported to Zach, and he ran his version of this product weekly meeting in mm -hmm. Coda. So we just started there, and he had his version of weekend update, which is more like a smile, how many smiley faces and word of the week, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it was word of the week and uh, win from last week. Yeah. And so that's where it all started. So we started using Coda there, and then, then we kind of expanded to, now other teams started using it for their own planning, and then we did quarterly planning using Coda KR, mm -hmm. and now a lot of teams run their processes in OKR. So another big process that, um, so now I run most of my processes in OKR. So just an example of a few things I run in uh, OKRs. Uh, we do tag ups, which I think Coda probably does as well, where the engineering product and design leads uh, uh, kind of meet together with their managers. Mm -hmm. And so every team within platform meets with myself and the engineering director and the design director. We have a Coda for that. Uh, so I started using that for Coda. And then mm -hmm. the, uh, the team started using that for their own um, kind of trickle down things too. Mm -hmm. uh, another good example is one-on-ones. I started using one-on-ones for Coda, and a lot of people adopted that as well because Zach started doing it with me. Um, and so it kind of just trickled down through the product yeah. org. And because product is pretty influential in that we run a lot of processes for the business, mm. if product people start using Coda for things, then it just by default becomes a thing other people use anyway because product people just have to run so many processes. Yeah. And so another good example is cross-functional meetings. We have a Coda template for cross-functional meetings. Um, which uh, let's see if I can find yeah, it. Yeah, let's check it out. Um, I think if I go over here and then go to templates, um, got to remember where I find templates. Oh, if you again. do click on new doc. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, new doc over here. Yeah. And then uh, let me see. If there's a do 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 cross functional. Oh yeah, XFN team template. So this kind of is cross-functional template for um, different teams. And so a good example here is like, for every cross-functional initiative, we like to establish a few different things. So we like to establish who the DACI is, which is the drivers, the approvers, the contributors, and input. We like to go through metrics every week. And then we, we like to have a metrics hub, and then we have a weekly meeting, nice. follow-ups, updates, blockers, topics, et cetera. And so that's kind of a good example of something else we started running. Mm -hmm. And now the interesting thing is now we're running cross-functional meeting in Coda. Well, now our cross-functional stakeholders are exposed to Coda because they're starting to use it. And so then mm -hmm. they start using it on their teams. And then it kind of just spreads like that. Um, yeah. So I always say, like, start small and then start introducing it in meetings that you run, and then it can spread from there. I love it. Um, I also would love to know, kind of um, thinking ahead, right, what are some of the things that you want to be adding to the Coda docs that are out in the wild? As far as, you know, you already talked about how you re-examined the dependencies and how they were being expressed. But anything else that's on your mind as far as the next bit of creativity you want to bring into your Coda docs? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think for me, a few things are that right now, one of the challenges I would say we have is we have a lot of data in Coda, but that it's all siloed in different Coda docs. Mm -hmm. I think one amazing thing would be to have like some kind of database of all tables in Brex's Coda domain in one Ooh. place and a way to connect tables between different Coda docs. So for example, um, you know, we have the H2 planning Coda doc, but then I had to create my own OKR tracker for it, but they should really be connected. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that would be kind of cool to have. Um, I think another thing is um, being able to better pull in data from other sources. So a really easy way to like import looker tables, for example, mm -hmm. or import data from other sources into Coda would be really helpful. And then last but not least, we still run our launch calendar in Jira. Mm. And I personally hate using Jira. Um, <laughs> I won't tell. So I would love to be able to run launch calendar in Coda, but engineering has to run its whole process in Jira for how it plans roadmaps, right? And we're not going to change that mm -hmm. because uh, Jira is a hub for engineering execution. 
And so if there was a better way of integrating that into, and I know there is a Jira integration encoder, mm -hmm. but it's kind of hard to use. Not everyone understands it. And so I think like having a better way to integrate uh, Jira into Coda would be really cool too. Yeah, I'd love to know, like what would that ideal situation look like, right? Because I'm of course thinking about, like you said, the Jira table, which allows me to pull in issues that are relevant to a certain project and then I can yeah. work in Coda, but I'd love to know kind of ideal situation. Um, yeah, so we actually, think about it. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we have initiatives in Jira and we use initiatives for every single thing that we're launching and mm -hmm. I'll uh, stop sharing my screen again. Cause I mean, I love those pictures. Now. Those nice. um, <laughs> and um, so it would be great to be able to, uh, so, and we tag initiatives that are launches. Um, and so mm -hmm. it'd be great to just filter all initiatives across all of our Jira tables into uh, all of our Jira issues into uh, that a tag does a launch into one coda table mm -hmm. and i tried doing that but i don't think there was a good way of seeing every single jira ticket across all of brex domain i think it was mm -hmm. like limited projects or something or it was like hard to understand how to do it and so mm -hmm. that would be something i would love to be able to do I mean, just make a note um, and maybe there's a good way of doing it um i i tried doing it at some point but could not work it out and so um that's something i think would be pretty cool i'll bring it in i'll be uh, as I'll, I'll shout around the office hey what do we think i'm sure someone brilliant um can can figure yeah. something out but i because, love that concept yeah yeah because i think like being able to run our launch calendar in coda would be huge because mm -hmm. the launch the coder is used more cross-functionally than jira yeah and there's so many cool things you can do in a launch calendar in coda you can't do in jira like being able to uh, approve launches or being able to vote up and down certain things, ask questions about launches, very yeah. similar to um, the Figma kind of launch calendar they yep. have, but integrated with Jira. Yeah, totally. Ooh, well, let me go ahead and I'll bring it to the group and I'll see what we can figure out. Um, Cause I, I love this idea. Cause I know that you're definitely not alone, right? That the idea of uh, engineering teams, like Jira is just gonna be what they're gonna use, right? Jira and yep. GitHub are just, part of what you need to do. And so helping people find those ways to connect and, and do even more connection beyond what you've already done, which is you know, very, very cross-functional and very integrated. I always like to know from you know, super, super makers like you, what advice do you give to people if they're getting ready to start to think about their quarterly planning process in Coda, what advice might you give to them? Um, I think my biggest piece of advice is work backwards. Like hmm. think about what you want to achieve with your coded doc at the end. Like imagine what success looks like and think about what the outputs of that doc would mm -hmm. be. And then it makes it a lot easier to structure the doc. So yeah. we knew as an output, we wanted to be able to see all the key results and dependencies across the whole company. Well, that meant we probably need a table for dependencies. And so that's why we decided to build a table for dependencies. Yeah. And I think thinking about it that way is very different from how you think about a doc. And that's why I always try to explain to people like, um, as someone that comes from a software engineering background, when I'm thinking about building a product, for example, I think about how to structure the database to achieve the goal of what the product is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think about Coda docs more like products that solve problems. Yeah. And so when you're thinking about how to build a product in a Coda doc, Coda doc is kind of like an app in a way, right? Then mm -hmm. you have to build your database to serve the end goal of the app. And so that's why I would like try to design what the app is going to look like. Mm -hmm. In this case, the app is like OKR planning. And then think about like, what is a database that we'll need to run to, to solve that problem and then yeah. build your data structure around it, um, which is not how we think about writing documents. When you think about right. writing a doc in Google, you start with the first word and just start writing. Right? <laughs> yeah, I love this idea, too, because I, I think sometimes it went with Coda, because it can be so powerful, it's so tempting to just be like, okay, I need to use all the things and all of the things are gonna be here and I'll just blah. But a little bit of intentionality and realizing like, oh, I actually don't need for my objectives and key results, like 50 columns with all this stuff. I actually just need these five components and that's gonna solve my problem. And, mm -hmm. and getting to that, and I love this idea of thinking about these as little products that you're building for a set of customers, which could be just mm -hmm. you or your team or your family or your whole company. Amazing. Yeah. Um, is there anything, if you think back to starting to build this planning doc or, or your team docs for that matter, um, is there anything that you would do differently if you were being able to hop into your time machine and, and start again? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think one is probably with the planning doc. One of the things that was a challenge that I mentioned earlier is responding to dependencies <clears throat> because each team was responding to one dependency row. And you'd have multiple teams responding to one row. It made it really hard for us to know when a dependency was resolved or not, and made it really hard to know who to uh, send a dependency to. So I probably add another layer, which is a dependency table, which is separate from projects. And so one project might have many dependencies. Yeah. It's all that problem. 
Yeah, I like that idea of like thinking about the scalability of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, the, what's the scale of the problem? Do we have just like one-to-one -one interactions or do we know mm -hmm. there's gonna be a lot? And then kind of planning for a little bit more breathing room, which I think is really, really smart. Excellent. Um, anything else that you wanna share with, with the groups or anything that you all are doing at Brex that you wanna plug? You've been so generous with your time. We wanna make sure we can give you a hand over the, the microphone to you. Of course, well, maybe I'll just talk about Brex a little bit. Yeah, um, for sure. So I'll share my screen again. Yeah. So I'm not sure how much people know about Brex, but um, our goal is to create an all-in-one finance for every business. Um, the way we started out was um, our founders realized um, that there wasn't a really good way for startups to get access to really great credit cards. Mm -hmm. A lot of times founders of startups um, maybe would not have an established credit score because they may be like new mm -hmm. um, to building credit, especially if they're on the younger side, they may be foreign founders just moved to the US, or it may just be that in building their startup, they had to run a lot of credit. And so um, by the time they raised funding, they now had like maybe 1.5 million, 2 million, $3 million that they could spend and no way to spend it on a credit card because no one would give them a high enough limit. Mm. So we built a corporate credit card, which was really based on your cash balance rather than your cash, uh, rather than your credit score. And that allowed us to build this really great experience with founders. Cool. Um, but we've expanded a lot since then. We've expanded from just having a credit card to now really having this all-in-one financial system for every growing business. And we want to serve every business in America that is really wants to reach their full potential. And there's a lot of different ways we do it. Um, so we provide you um, with a cash management account that's smarter than a bank account. It lets you do ACH, wires, look at your cash flow and understand it. Um, it lets you deposit checks really easily using our mobile app and it all is free. It doesn't cost anything. We don't have any fees. Nice. Um, we help you grow your business by giving you access to um, instant access to your revenue. So if you use um, Shopify, Stripe or Amazon, um, then the cool thing is you can connect those. And then instead of waiting until Amazon or Stripe pay you out, you can get an instant payout on Brex based on us integrating with Shopify and knowing that you're going to get paid out in five or six days. Because yeah. a lot of these companies, they pay you out maybe uh, a week after you've received the revenue. So we let you have it in advance. Um, some of the other cool things we do is we have really great spend management controls as well. So we help you spend smarter. We help you track expenses across your whole team. We let you deploy virtual cards to everyone in your team, which is amazing when you're going remote. Yeah. And those virtual cards work with Apple Pay. So you can connect oh. those virtual cards to Apple Pay. And then every single one person on your team can have a card they can use from their phone without ever having to mail them a card which is really great for remote first work. Yeah. We also let you know if there's anomalies in spend happening. So if someone spent on something they shouldn't have, or if some weird spending change happened in one team, we can let you know about it. And so there's lots of different ways that we can help you build your, build your company. And we have a new premium product that kind of brings all of this together cool. as well. So our goal really, and our vision in the long term <laughs> is to basically help every growing business really reach their full potential. And the way we want to do that is build this all in one financial service. And so if you think about, um, Tech, technology um, and technology infrastructure, Amazon did this by providing AWS. If you think about sales and revenue um, generation, Salesforce did this, but it doesn't really exist for running your business's finances. And so we yeah. want to put that all in one place. And you can kind of imagine it like um, kind of this operating system for your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm almost imagining, you know, I was thinking about again, like how do you make those big bets and the box that you create and those vision decks, I can see like the people that you're thinking about. And I love that it's thinking about you know, these people with great ideas and how can you empower them to be able to actually make those things a reality. And then imagining like the vision deck with all of these, you know, small businesses or, you know, growing startups and everything. I just think that's amazing. Excellent. Yeah, actually, um, Ferguson Books was our, um, <laughs> our customer for H2, and our, all of our vision decks was based around Ferguson Books and the business uh, owner. Amazing. I love it. And that's the picture on the right, yes? Yep. Cool. All right. Well, everybody, we've got about five more minutes. So if there's any other questions you have for AJ or myself, please let us know. Otherwise, thank you all so much for spending your Friday with us. Thank you, AJ, for being so generous with your time and sharing your tips and your tricks and how you think about it. I know I left with some things that I'm that have reframed how I think about designing docs, which is fantastic. So if there's anything else that you all need, let us know by clicking ask a question. Otherwise, enjoy your weekend. Happy planning. And we'll see you around. Any other sort of final words of wisdom, AJ, or uh, things for the for the week that we should think about? Um, I would just say that um, Coder is kind of whatever you want to make it. Um, <laughs> it's a really powerful tool, but it can be kind of scary. So start small and do like little fun things like, you know, the photo of the week. And that's a great way to get people uh, kind of introduced to Coder and then you can build from there. Mm -hmm.
I love that. Yeah, and it's one of those things where, you know, I always try and reinforce for folks that just because you haven't made a huge giant doc that's got, you know, packs connected and inter integrations and automations, it doesn't mean that you haven't made something amazing, right? Something as small as I've created a way for people to upload their pictures from the weekend so that we as a team can create some more sense of belonging and a little bit more humanness in this world of remote work. Like that's a huge thing, even though it's a simple table with a button that you know adds a picture. But those small things can sometimes make the biggest impact. So definitely celebrate your successes no matter what size they are, because if they solve a problem, that's what matters. All right, awesome. everybody. Excellent. Well, looks like we're good. AJ, have a lovely weekend. I hope you have some wonderful pictures that are suitable for weekend update on Monday. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure nerding out with you and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. We'll see you around. Thank you. Bye, have a great weekend, everyone. And enjoy your codering. <laughs>